I already know this episode will be well received because on this episode is a local fan favorite, Mike Curtis. Why do people love Mike? Because he's just a good guy. He's as good as they come. Uh, he and I both share a passion for helping the next wave of UX designers find their place in this field. He's an instructor and a mentor to many. On the episode today, we talk about designing the way others experience you. Whether you're in school, interviewing, in an internship, or with 10 plus years of experience, people are experiencing you in their own ways. And have you considered how your experience might be? Are you sharing the right story and messaging? Mike has some thoughts on how to improve how others are currently experiencing you. So let's get into it. I can't start. Off. So I recognize my last my last editing I did is I say something along the lines of like, so without further ado, this is Mike Curtis. And then I transition to Mike, welcome to the show. I'm like, they don't need to say their name back to back. So I'm not going to start with Mike. Welcome to the show. Maybe I'll just start with this whole story. There we go. Uh, but thanks for coming on the show. I really appreciate you taking the time to take your uh, busy schedule and fit design today into it. Yeah, I, I really appreciate you having me out. I think this is a great opportunity. Appreciate you've uh, you've done a good job of, uh, I guess, positioning yourself in the community of, I don't want to say making a name for yourself. That's not the purpose of why you're doing what you're doing. But, you know, just being an active collaborator and uh, communicator is just involved in the community. And I think your actions speak volumes for the respect that you have within the community. So it's really cool to see. Awesome. Thank you. Um, excited to have you on the show today. Before we get too much into our topic, I do want to give you just a quick chance to introduce where you're at. Um, tell me a little bit about 1-800-CONTACTS, maybe where you came from before that. Uh, I know school wasn't too long ago for you, so a lot of our audience that listens to this is either in school or recently out of school, mm -hmm. and I think they'll be inspired to know uh, some of your success, success that you've had since getting out of school. So just tell me a little bit about that. You bet, man. So, I mean, the funny thing is I've been telling people... I don't know, for the past couple months that, Hey, next year I turn 40 and it doesn't feel like it's that it's that close, but that's kind of the, the scary part about this. I think there's some things to be learned there in my career that I, I'm sharing nowadays with people. But yeah, I mean, for the past, I don't know, it was about 15 years or so I was in the marketing space. I mean, mm -hmm. I was, uh, I was building brochures and doing graphic design and, during that time from about 2001 to, I don't know, 2010 or so, I was very much like in the marketing world. That yeah. was, that was where my love was. That was what I was doing. I kind of started to miss, uh, interacting with people as much. So I was like, okay, maybe I need to step it more into sales and like mm -hmm. get back out there and talk mm -hmm. to people. And, and I love that. I love sales. There was some aspect of that that was a little tough at times, like to be an outside salesman traveling and it's rough on your car. It's rough on you. It's rough to get rejection sometime from people. And, and so as I started, uh, about 2000, so I don't know, 2015 or so I was like, hold on, there's gotta be more to this. There's gotta be like, sure. There's something I'm missing here. Like I love the marketing world. I love people. So I, I started looking into more. I was actually looking into being a web developer. I thought, well, maybe that's where the money is. Maybe that's what I need to do. You know, it's so funny how many people who, when they make that career transition, they first think of like, maybe I'll get into developing. Yeah. And then they go, actually, I like this part, but keep going. Well, Sorry. no, yeah. So that's the funny part is I, uh, so I, I looked into schools and I was like, okay, I've done some schooling, but I want to do something that kind of propels me forward in the industry. And so I found Dev Mountain. That was what I found. And I went there for the the web developer course. So I was like, oh, okay, I'm going to go to an orientation, check it out. Well, lo and behold, I get there and it wasn't the web developer. I had the overlooked what the the announcement was and it was actually for UX. No. And way. I actually I mean, I hadn't actually heard that specific term before. <laughs> Before 2015, 16, I just hadn't heard it. And I sat there and I thought to myself, oh, man, this is it. Like, why haven't I heard about this? And kid you not, I have not looked back. I mean, that I, I took my experiences from being in the marketing world and being in yeah. sales. And I thought, 
this is it. Like, this is what the world's missing out on is this need that we have to design good experiences for people. What and, an amazing accident. Yeah, I know. Right. It, it really was. And so from then on, uh, so yeah, Dev Mountain was a huge part of my career shift. And I have since, uh, so I've done that program. I have taught there. I have mentored there. Mm-hmm. I have helped a lot of people that have come from there or come straight out of a university uh program and just really tried to position myself in a way that I'm here to help, but I know that, you know, I'm, I'm leveraging what I have from my past and what you're bringing to the table and let's see if we can work together. Yeah. And, and so, yeah, I'm now I'm working over at 1-800-CONTACTS as a UX designer there. Uh, We like to, we call ourselves product designers there. We're in the squad setup, kind of like Spotify and a lot of other organizations here are set up. And it's great because we have five of those squads set up there. And then we also have, we call them our, our product hive um, across like a horizontal. So I have multiple product designers that I collaborate with to build product there. And we're doing some really cool stuff in the telemedicine world in that space. Cool. Uh, some really cool things you can check out in our app or on our website. And it's just a lot of fun because you're constantly surrounded by super smart people doing really cool things out yeah. there in the industry. Yeah. And the best way to do that is to have good collaboration and good synergy with your your squad, with uh-huh. your we actually call them swarms at 1-800 contacts. Cool. But to have that synergy and then be able to work across and say I don't know everything there is about solving a problem in design, but right. I've got a network of people around me that can help. So I think we have a really cool That's setup awesome. there for solving problems and That's awesome. building cool stuff. And how long have you been there now? Uh, this will be two years this month. So cool. yeah, or next month, two years. Very cool. Moving along pretty well, quick. We're lucky to have you there. Yeah. And you. Dev Mountain was how long ago? Uh, that was at the beginning of 2017. Cool. Yeah. So you've had a lot of success since Dev Mountain. Yeah. And I think a lot of people find that inspiring, right? Because there's a lot of designers who are coming out of school, boot camps, whatever it may be. And, you know, it's a tough marketplace to get into right now. It's just I feel like there's a big supply and demand. Uh, I don't want to say issue, but, you know, there's a big supply and demand difference that we have right now in, in Utah County, uh, Salt Lake County for UX designers. There's a lot of designers who are... Uh, I don't want to say sit at home twiddling their thumbs, <laughs> but they're trying to figure out how do I land my first gig? How do I get my foot in the door? Yeah. Um, and I think that really ties in closely to this conversation that you and I are about to have. You bet. Uh, when you and I got on the phone a couple of weeks ago and we started talking about topics, I really liked you uh, introducing this topic. So if you don't mind, let me let me have you share that again and talk about this this personal experience. Yeah, I'd love to. I felt like, you know, as we had that conversation, we both kind of hit it off on the yeah. subject like, this is it. This is Uh what needs to be talked about. So let me preface that a little bit with the backstory as to why I'm so passionate about it right now, because I think that's, that's important too. I, as part of my time teaching at Dev Mountain, I, I'm surrounded constantly by people that are way smarter than me. And I think that's how we grow. And that happened to be the case when you're, when you're teaching at a school, you know, there are people in the room that are pretty darn smart, you know? And I thought to myself, what, aside from the curriculum, aside from what I know, what do I have to offer these people that will really help them after the, the curriculum's taught, the school is done. And I couldn't quite figure it out because I could teach them UX methodologies, Mm -hmm. but then what, how Mm -hmm. do I get them in the door? How do I get them into those interviews? And so I thought, well, maybe the best thing I can do is start reaching out to those smart people, the senior talent, the VPs of product and different people I know that can help. So I did that. I reached out and was getting some really, really good responses from people around the Valley. And one of the ones that stood out the most was I reached out to Mariah Hay, Mm -hmm. the VP of product Mm -hmm. at Pluralsight. And she said something to me that I just, I still can't get it out of my head. And I feel like it's, it's what's kind of changed me. And she said that, you know, Mike, you need to teach them or help them understand that they need to design the way others experience them. Use your new UX skills that you have to design the way you're experienced. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I didn't think much about it when I read it, but as I kept going over it, I'm like, wow, there's, that is it. Like we know UX practices, but do we know how to apply those to ourselves and, and create a product us that is well experienced. And so 
for the past year or so, I have been, I, I, I spoke about it. I have been teaching constantly about it. I've since written seven or so articles on Medium that dive specifically into those, what you can do to design that experience. And I think there's more. I, I'm not done. I mean, I, I constantly will have interactions with people and I think to myself, oh man, that's it. Like there's something with what just happened in this conversation, right. good or bad, right. that we need to talk about yeah. and people. So can you teach it to people? I think so. I mean, you can't force someone to make those changes, but you can help them recognize what needs to change. And that's that's kind of what's led into this. How do you design the way you're experienced? Absolutely. It's it's about recognizing what you need to do about it. And here was the light bulb moment for me as, as you were describing that to me. I mean, I was in fact, you probably heard it over the phone. I mean, my arms were in the air and I'm like, yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, and for those who listen to the show, they've heard me share the story again. But over the last couple of years, you know, I've been on the phone uh, conducting phone interviews and person interviews with probably 40 to 50 candidates uh, with that associate or internship level uh, you know, resume. And that thing that is always standing out to me is that on paper at that uh, that level fresh out of school they really don't look too different mm -hmm. you know they've got a couple of projects that they've worked on maybe they've done some freelance stuff for a family member or a friend or something like that but outside of that they just don't look too different mm -hmm. uh, and so that's why i was going how do you make a decision <laughs> all these candidates look great i don't know how to pick the winner yep. you know and I've learned a lot since then but one of the big differentiators that that we're going to hit on is the the thing that really stood out to me between I'm not going to say the winners and the losers because it wasn't <laughs> that, but the ones that really you know, attracted me to like, I want them on the team were the ones that demonstrated some of these skills that I think you're going to dive into. Yeah, for sure. Um, Mariah Hayes, she's been pretty active about talking about that, you know, that experience of you. And yep. I think this topic is something that uh, for those new designers, they need to look more and more into. If it's on your medium, you know, we'll, we'll plug that as well. Uh, let's, let's get the opportunity for people to get eyes on this contact. And, um, Mariah, if you're watching, we want you on the show too. So I think this this is a great this, this is a great uh, topic for us to be considering. And again, if you're a new designer who's listening to this, you need to understand that it's not just about the hard skills. It's not just about how proficient you are in sketch or in design or in vision or you know whatever whatever. whatever. I, it's not all about that. I think there's something more. Yep. So let me let me give you the mic and. Uh, Talk to me a little bit about what those skills are. Yeah. So one of the ones that one of the, uh, like I said, I've written about seven different things that you can look into. And you made me think just from what you were talking about, about one of them that I want to make sure I talk about. And that's, it sounds very, I don't know, cheesy on the surface, but when, when I was back in my marketing time and I was running an online e-commerce store mm -hmm. and one of the things when I was interviewing and hiring people for, for our call center positions, I don't know why I hired those people. If I look back before knowing some of these things, I would just say, you know, maybe I just like them. Maybe they just, uh -huh. there's something about it. Like I just like, we, click. we clicked. Yeah. Yep. But as I, as I try to define that, it was more the way I would define it is that I feel like they shined and I feel like there was something about the way that person held themselves and sure. the way they interacted. Uh, you know, some of the things I write about is that, uh, uh, they they distinguish themselves to shine is to to distinguish yourself from amongst the crowd like there's a glow there's something about them right so i go through i go through some of that in this article and i talk about what does it take to shine and do you notice the ones that do can you can you figure out you know what it is about the ones that do shine so another thing i really like to say too and you've probably heard the quote or it you know, they'll sound kind of silly, but it's true is if you're if you are going to rise this morning, then you might as well shine. You know, we hear rise and shine. Yep. You ever thought about that? Have you ever stopped to, like, apply that and say, if I'm going to rise today, then I'm going to shine. And that's kind of the, the starting point. Like, OK, I realize that I need to shine some way, somehow. Um, and so I've, I've kind of stepped that back and I've said, all right, well, if I'm going to do that, Think about like social situations that you're, you get yourself into, even this, you know, conversation we're having right now. Is there an, a certain amount of energy that we can match to have mm -hmm. a good conversation? Mm -hmm. I've I've talked to so many people where I get into this conversation and there's an energy about our conversation that makes it click, like you said, or maybe it just doesn't work. Like maybe in this situation, there's a high amount of like positive energy. Mm -hmm. And if you can match that and get yourselves 
get yourself to that level of a high energy in a situation, great. Mm -hmm. If it's hard for you to match that energy, or if you come into the room as like that super exuberant, you know, excited one, but no one else is feeling it, you might want to dial that back down and Mm -hmm. kind of take a read of the room. Uh, I've, I've heard of people in interviews where they have tried to crack a joke at the onset of the interview Mm -hmm. to kind of gauge the situation and it just doesn't fly. And they're like, okay, maybe that wasn't, you know, maybe I need to take it down a notch. And if you can pick up on that ability to, you know, read the room room. and say, okay, maybe I need to dial it down, but energy matching. So that's another one. Like, can you match the energy of a room? Totally. Um, And then another one I'm really passionate about, especially working in the, the vision space, you know, is 2020 vision, but more about your 2020 social vision. Mm -hmm. So do you have 2020 social? What does that mean to have 2020 social vision? Uh, A lot of that is as I look, you know, as you look straight ahead, what are you missing? I feel like we miss so much by just looking straight at a person. Try making eye contact with someone for seven seconds straight without looking away Mm -hmm. like I'm doing with you right Mm -hmm. now. And it gets awkward. It's like I have to either look away or I have to check out other things or look down. It's funny funny because it just almost feels like unnatural if we were just to stare Mm -hmm. at each other. It's like, what are you doing? Yeah. What are you doing, man? Back off. Yeah. You know, I I had a conversation about this with one of my developers where I, I asked him about this, about I was talking to him about what I was doing on the, on these articles. And I, I found out from him that he hates to make eye contact mm-hmm. with people. So I started watching him and sure enough, the guy never looks straight at people. Sure. Um, but then there's something else about this 2020 social vision. Yeah. And that is what else is going on in the room when you walk in. So many sure. of us miss the picture. I mean, looking around in the room I'm in right now, I just want to have a conversation with you about these boards off to the side and about all the equipment you have in the room. I want to do a podcast. That's Uh cool. Like, how do I do it? Well, I noticed you have all these things. You've got books sitting over here, you know, that, and you take, you take note of what's in the room Sure. and people that do that. Well, a salesman does that really well, right? Like a salesman can walk in and say, okay, I see a signed baseball on the shelf. Let's talk about that. I mean, that's my team, you know, but if I'm looking right at you and I notice, Hey, Dylan has a sunburn on his head or something like, Dude, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> for that reason. like, you know what, tell me the story. Like, I mean, we, yeah. you know, before starting this podcast, we had a great conversation about something that we might not have made that conversation had we not, you know, noticed something about what was going on in the room. So I think a lot is missed out on by not matching the energy of what's going on in the room. And then reading the room, like that social vision that we have. If you look at really good leaders that inspire you and have taught you a lot in your career, I like to refer to those good leaders as having really good peripheral product vision. Mm -hmm. So for instance, uh, our VP uh, or our our director of e-commerce, our VP of digital commerce, um, she is extremely good at having this peripheral vision of social situations, but also what's going on with the product, the business sense, the the bigger picture. So that leadership skill can be distilled down to a social skill of having really good peripheral vision of noticing what's going on with her employees. How is really good product built? If you can step back and get out of your head for a little bit and look around and kind of see how product is built, that peripheral vision that you have of product, that can be turned right back around on you. You can say, okay, socially in social situations, do I have that peripheral product vision to pick out what's going on and get it, you know? Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's one I'm really passionate about as well. You know, I think that's a great one. Let me, I want to put a pin in that one real quick because, you know, Cameron Mole, he's got uh, something about, you know, three, three skills that every UX designer needs to have. And one of those skills is a facilitator. And I think that talks about the, you know, being able to see the peripheral and specifically in a meeting setting, right? Let's say, I mean, you, at one hundred context, you guys work in squads, right? So mm-hmm. you'll often find yourself in meetings where you've got product managers, developers, maybe QA, maybe stakeholders, executives, whatever it may be. There's a lot of people in the room with a lot of different expertise. And I do think it's a UX designers, uh, it's in their wheelhouse, in their skill set to be a facilitator in that meeting For and sure. recognize that, listen, 
development really hasn't spoken up. And I noticed that when executive says, we need to have this thing turned out in three months, both my developers just put their head down <laughs> and you're kind of going, okay, they're not loving this idea. We got to be able to kind of note these things and then, and then pick up on the, how we shift that meeting. And you know what, let me, maybe we have our developers now speak up a little bit more. Tell me a little bit about what you guys think is feasible, right? And I think it's totally a skill set that you, you don't learn that one in a UX course, Yep. but it's totally something that you talk about reading the room. I got to understand what's going around me and I got to understand what are these the social skills, you know, how is everyone feeling in this conversation? What is the energy level? Yeah. Let me ask you a follow-up question because you also talked about Let's say you come into a room and you've got a lot of energy and you notice that everyone else is kind of down here. But what if naturally your energy level is high and coming down just feels a little bit unnatural for you? I think a lot of people would say like, but that's not me. That's not me being authentic to myself or even the reverse. What if you're naturally more mellow and you go into a meeting where everyone's just real bubbly and peppy <laughs> and that kind of stuff? Like, and you might go, that's not me. Right. How do you handle those situations? What are your thoughts? So. That is a great question. And most recently, so I wrote about emotional intelligence. And if you haven't looked into emotional intelligence, you have to, because I don't care if you're a product leader. I don't care if you're still in school, if you're switching careers, I don't care what your IQ is. Emotional intelligence is your EQ or your emotional intelligence. Mm -hmm. And what that allows for you to do. In fact, I want to talk a little bit more about that. Um, probably specifically on, on your pod. And I hope I can share like a, a message with you or like a story with you about yeah. that, because this, this really occurred for me and it really hit my brain hard almost a year ago today. Uh, my mom, so I was, I was in the ER with my mom when she was describing in detail uh, to the doctor, the plans that she had to end her life. And I hope I don't get too emotional here with this, but I want this is an emotional podcast. <laughs> so Safe place. can can you imagine the thoughts that go through your head when you as as a son are listening to your mom share these things with a doctor? Sure. Now, my mom is still here. She got the help that she needed. But what in that moment, what that did for me is it got the emotions running. If mm -hmm. ever you want the emotions to get running, get yourself into, you know, a crazy situation and the emotions run high and they are hard to handle and you are impulsive and you, you want to say things and you want to react in ways that uh, maybe you shouldn't. Sure. And, and that's, that's the tough side of it, of emotional intelligence is like, I need to be self aware of my emotions. I'm aware of the anger I have of the, the frustration I have of everything I want to say to my mom in mm -hmm. this moment. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, but the self-regulation, which is the other part of, of emotional intelligence is, can I regulate those emotions? So how many emotions does the human body, you know, go through a ton? I don't know the number. I'm sure you could Google it, but can you regulate those emotions? Now that goes back to your question about the, uh, that high energy, right? And that's maybe that's not me. Well, I think a lot of that is the emotional intelligence you have to regulate, uh, on the spot in those situations. And you can go and read more about that. I've written a little bit about it because I can't psychologists can cover this topic in much, much more detail and sure. I actually refer to them. But the other part of emotional intelligence is the socially how socially aware we are of others' emotions. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you mentioned in that room when you notice those developers and their heads go down. I mean, that's the that's the magic light switch that should go off where you say you connect with that, those heads going down. There's emotions of frustration going on there. Mm -hmm. There's emotions of uh, we're not going to be able to do this and, and doubt and how many other things are going right. on, right? If right, you can right. pick up on that. So, and, and I think that applies to your point of how do we do that? How do we, how do we adapt on the spot when maybe that's not us? Yep. Um, I don't think we're changing our, our personalities completely. I think that we're learning how to be self-aware of the emotions that we're feeling. Uh, emotions are, are those energies, that happiness, that excitement, the, the, uh, the joy we feel of, you know, relationships, but then can we regulate those emotions? Can we act on them? And I think there's an important uh, differentiator between there because you do want somebody who feels natural, who's feeling genuine, who's, uh, really is comfortable in their own skin acting the way that you know is natural to them 
So it, it isn't saying, you know, you're a natural 10. I need you to come down to like a seven. <laughs> it's, it's not that. Right. It's saying I need you to be you, but also be able to regulate. I think understand the situation, understand, you know, the time and place, as they might say. Um, I've had experiences where I've hired designers who are at a more naturally higher level because I want that on my team yeah. because naturally that's not exactly me. And I like that personality. And I think that brings a lot to the team. If somebody's that high, uh, you know, high energy, peppy, like that adds a lot to the team. So I do need you to bring that natural charisma to the team, but also I need you to recognize when we regulate it, when we get into the meetings, you know, what, what's working, what's, professional what's uh you know where's the time and place for it so it is important to understand that be you <laughs> understand the when to regulate yeah so i i would highly encourage anybody that is trying to figure that out about maybe why they're not finding success in a career change or the next job move you know trying to find the next hire or whatever that is to really dive into emotional intelligence i i'm still learning about it i mean ever since that day about a year ago that's kind of been my topic like how mm-hmm. do i how do i handle that 1-800 contacts actually sponsored an event called light the fight mm-hmm. where we talked about depression and suicide awareness and all these things and and that was just another catalyst to me really diving into this topic because yep. the social interactions you have with people, this experience we have of other people, if you if you really start looking into a person's personality, uh, you you start to pick out how socially aware they are, and and that can really affect the success they have in life, yeah. the next job they get. Yeah. It's so important. Um, th- and there's a few other little things I've talked about too. Yeah. Uh, you, you actually did one of these, you might not have noticed it, but I picked it out. Uh, and this is one I wrote about, about just remembering someone's name, mm-hmm. the power of a name. If you've ever read, uh, how to win friends and influence, influence people, people yeah. Dale Carnegie, he said that a person's name is like the sweetest, most powerful word to them ever you know just taking just remembering someone's yep. name so you did a podcast well they recorded you at UVU mm-hmm. you had that and i was listening to it and someone was asking a question and then other people went on to ask questions and some time went on and one of the students asked another question and you called them out by name and you said i think his name was Stephen or something like that and you said oh well Stephen so and so you know and you answered their question. And I thought, okay, Dylan, that was cool. Like I'll bet Steven, if that was his name, I'll bet he loved that because here you are like a leader in the the UX and product design space. And you took the time through the nervousness, the stress of, you know, being recorded and being on camera and, and knowing that your words were, you know, being taken as this is, this is a leader in the space. You took the time to remember his name. And I was like, that was cool. And maybe you didn't notice that, that but uh, there was something to that. Yep. Can you remember some, and there are little tricks you can do, right? Like write the name down or like when I was teaching at Deb Mountain, I'm meeting 12 to 20 students at a time. Yep. So I would, I would make little squares and put their name on a piece of paper when first day of class happened. And then when they'd come up and introduce themselves, I'd write the next person down. And within a day or two, I'm good because I've got it on paper. If they move, I would move the square. And within one or two days, I've remembered everyone's name. Like find a way to remember someone's name. Go introduce them to somebody else, you know. Um, I'm just going to say one more time. I think that skill right there could help set you apart in an interview, Mm -hmm. right? You walk into an interview with six people in there. Yep. It is nerve wracking. It is overwhelming. And there's a, this, this, the niceties that you, that you, uh, allow, right? Where you, hi, I'm Dylan. And they say, hi, I'm Mike. Yep. And then you kind of go around the room and because you're just observing these niceties, sometimes you just, you missed all of that. Yep. Like, oh, I just let all those words go right over my head. I didn't hear a word they actually said. That is exactly true. So it takes, you know, emotional intelligence or maybe <laughs> it, does. it takes uh, a little bit of, uh, just, spatial awareness of Mike's in front of me. He just told me his name. I now know Mike. Yep. Now we move to the next person. And Samantha just introduced herself. And now I'm saying hi to Samantha, right? And I think when you pick up on those things, I do, I do agree. I think some, if I have that skill set, it's because I, I know a couple mentors in my life who have demonstrated that and it's meant a lot to me. Yeah. And so I appreciate the compliment. I, I just think that that skill set, um, 
you go, oh, yeah, how can I how can I actually apply that one? You can start to apply it on the phone interviews. You can start to apply it at the product time meetups or whatever <laughs> meetup you're going to. Yeah. You can apply it in a uh, in an interview that may be overwhelming with six people. But if you can pick up on that skill, I really do think it goes a long way. You know, and it's it's not it's not too der- too terribly difficult. You can actually have fun with it. I mean, I I think of uh remembering the name Julia and thinking of Julia Gulia from, I think it's the wedding singer. I'm even forgetting the, but you know, like, can you rhyme the name with something, you know, sure. um, maybe the name is Amanda and you have a, you have a niece named Amanda uh-huh. or someone from high school that was named that, that you remember, you know, can you make an association? But, but to your point, it goes a long way. Yep. It, it definitely does. Uh, the other thing too, I want to mention is, is just how good of a listener you are. So, can you listen to what is going on, even in this conversation, without taking all the time in your head and getting so caught up with your own thoughts that your own thoughts are what you've got to get out next, not mm-hmm. taking in what the other person is talking about? Mm-hmm. Um, I, I write about the the word ting, which is uh, to listen in Chinese. Okay, uh, Ting is a super cool word. If you if you look it up, it's T-I-N-G, and just do like a Google image search for it, okay? And it will be broken down into like five or six parts, kind of depends on where you look. But the art, I call it the art of listening, people just don't do it enough. People don't take the time to listen intently and fully commit themselves to a conversation. And again, this applies to an interview setting, a, a, a meeting, a design critique. I don't care what it is. If you can't listen, And kind of, you know, take in what you're hearing. Anyway, the word, the word ting breaks it down to, if you look at the way it's, it's drawn, the character for, for that word, they break it down into the eyes and then the word king. And then it looks at the mind. It looks at, you know, being one with the conversation and it looks at the heart. Mm. All of these are part of the word ting. And the cool part about that is. Yeah, you need your ears, right? If you've got to listen to the conversation, the king, the character that they draw for king signifies that the ears are the most important part. Yep. So that's why they're first and foremost on that character. But next is the mind. Like if you don't take in what I'm talking to you about right now, it might just like fly right sure. past you and sure. you might be like, Mike, this is a weird conversation. Why are we talking about this? Um, but then you've got to be at one with that conversation, right? You've got to look with your eyes and what, am I noticing any nonverbal cues? Are you mm-hmm. fidgeting or being a little weird? Like mm-hmm. you've got to pick up on that stuff again. In a, in a meeting with developers, in a, in a design review, in an interview, I don't care. Any of those settings, you've got to pick up on the nonverbal. I agree. Um, and then do you notice that when you are at one with a conversation that things just click and that helps your heart be engaged in the conversation so that they can tell that it's genuine, right? Mm. So that's another thing to look into. Are you genuine in your conversations and intently listen like do you commit your full attention yeah. to the conversation yep. yeah, you I called it the, the art of listening i've heard it referred to as uh, active listening and i think it's a very important skill set and, you know you you see it demonstrated um i've seen it demonstrated in my own life where you let's just say you've got a stakeholder who starts the conversation about we really need to get this out the door in the next three weeks <laughs> and immediately your thoughts go Oh, you're such an idiot. There's no way we can possibly get this out the door in the next three weeks. Uh, they don't even understand all the things that we've got going on. They haven't even considered. We've been staring at this so much longer than they have. All the while, they're, they're talking. still talking. <laughs> yep. And you have completely ignored everything else. And what you might find is if you can be an active listener, is that they just explain to them the pressures that they're under. Or they just explained the the reasoning that they believe this, that they need to do this. That you might understand their point of view, right? And there's all these different things that you could pick up on if you were actively listening, but instead you either went to, uh, here's why you're wrong and here's what I'm going to say next, or or you're just tuned out. I mean, oh my gosh, those, those skill sets to be able to take what you just heard and now think through it and now come out with something to say, if you need to say anything yeah. at all, uh, is a, is a skill set that I really think UX designers should be more geared to do well, uh, than maybe others, because that is at the very center of what we do as designers. We don't design for ourselves, right? So you've got to figure out what is the feedback that's out there and how can you gather it and, and check on the little things like be, be in the moment, like, 
one of the things when I first when smartwatches first came out, it really drove me nuts. I still don't wear one. Yeah, see, there because he goes. That. <laughs> they check their smart. Like, I, oh, that's a good. Yeah, I wasn't they, doing no, that. No, by no, the way. no. I know, but, <laughs> but like. That's what we do, yep. and it's almost this subconscious. It's thing. no different like, than pulling out the right. I need it. to look right, like yep. I need to see what that thing was, or I, I watch people just checking their their meetings for the day. Like I'll look, I'll glance over and be like, "Why are you on your calendar when we're talking about you know a rebranding of the site or something?" Like yep. get off of that and let's talk and let's let's uh, let's be one with the conversation. Yep. Uh, so yeah, I th- can I tell you another pet peeve? Because I think people think <laughs> this one. I love pet peeves. Let's I, talk about it. I think this one is uh, one that I think people are they think they're doing you a service but i actually think the how people receive it is still a disservice yeah is that they want you to think like i'm giving you my full time and attention so i'm putting my phone on the table face down and they think like that shows to you that i'm not looking at, at my phone it's like you don't need to put a face down just put it in your pocket and keep it away right you don't need to prove to me that your phone's face down now in front of you just keep it Keep it out of here. sight. Yeah. yeah. And, and then, then we don't have to observe it. Yep. And, you know, if, if your phone still goes off or it vibrates, we're still going to recognize it. Right. So I don't know why we have to have the phone out. Just put it I'll away. bet your eyes are going to glance when it does buzz. Just put it <laughs> Just away. Put it away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, that's a great point. I think, I think a lot can be learned about that. Just taking the time to listen and kind of give your full attention to a conversation. Mm-hmm. It's huge. Um, yeah. Last thing is that... The the product we design, I mean, think of all of the deliverables that we have in product design. Mm-hmm. We're, we're doing all that. We start, how do you start designing a product? You, you start from the research. You start with defining the problem. How are we going to solve this? Like doing your strategizing, market research, content audits, all of that before work that goes on to kind of figure out what the problem is. Well, have you ever taken some of those deliverables or some of those activities and like flip them back on yourself? Mm-hmm. So I started doing one of these, which people might think I'm kind of weird for doing it. I don't care. Like that's, <laughs> that's just part of my weird nature, I guess, with kind of being more passionate about this subject sure. lately. Uh, one of the ones is doing a SWOT analysis. I call it the self SWOT. Mm-hmm. And we, if you're in the product design world, you kind of know, what that is, it's the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats that we do when we're looking at solving a problem in design. And we look at the strengths that we have. If those are internal, we're looking internally at that and the weaknesses we have. Yep. And the external is what are those opportunities and threats? Well, what about how those apply to yourself? Right. So grab a spreadsheet. I don't care what tool you like to use. Uh, I have, I have a spreadsheet that I'll probably never show anybody because I actually do that for most of the people that I have met in my life that I have somewhat of a relationship with. So this is an extensive spreadsheet I keep of people that I look at their strengths and their weaknesses and their opportunities and their threats. And yes, you're on it. And it's like, Uh yeah, well, I mean, and it's a good thing because Uh I'm, I don't have to show that to anybody, but what it helps me do is it helps me. I mean, what do you do with a SWAT? Well, you analyze it, you convert weaknesses into opportunities. Mm -hmm. You convert, you know, how do you look at the negative things and convert them into positive things on one of those? How do you pick out and synthesize a SWOT analysis into opportunities for yourself? You can do that. Look at the leaders you that inspire you in your yeah. life. Look at the people that bug you. Maybe there's family members on there, you know, maybe there's in-laws on there that you yeah. want to put on there. It doesn't mean you have to show it to anybody, sure. but it has to be an actionable uh, deliverable that you create for yourself. Uh-huh. And once you take the time to create, something like that, if you want to do it, I think it will yield some pretty cool results Mm -hmm. to just say, okay, I've built a SWOT analysis. What do I do with it? Well, can I change my personality or change my, the way I am in certain situations? Who's done it well? Yeah. What actions and characteristics might I want to avoid? You know, what are the threats? And anyway, it's been kind of a fun activity for me to create, but uh, you can try that too. What are the other UX deliverables that we we kick out there to the world that we might be able to flip back on ourselves. I think there's a lot of them. I mean, that could be a topic in and of itself. Oh, yeah. You know, the one I just want to plug then as we wrap up is, is this idea of we spend so much time gathering.
gathering feedback. Uh, but it's very hard to receive feedback on a personal critique, like yep. looking inward to see how do other people experience me and what's the feedback that they have. Yeah. And I, I've shared an experience about that. I've done a 360 peer review and I thought I was prepared for it. Like <laughs> I really thought I put myself into a place where I was ready to, to get that feedback. And then when I started going through it, I was like, <laughs> Oh, that's they can a bit open harder. Your eyes, yeah. yeah, it's a bit harder than I thought it was going to be to to actually take it all in. Yeah. Um, but I think it's a skill set we need to get better at. We need to be okay with is being able to get feedback from whether it's your family, your friends, um, your coworkers, your peers, whatever it may be. Look to gain feedback from those people who you're closest to because I think they've got the right things to say. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I I totally stripped that one down and I did one of those that you can do anytime you want, create a free Google form or whatever, and ask your friends anonymously or your family or network, what are three adjectives that you would use to describe me? Mm -hmm. And ask this anonymously and then ask them, what are three adjectives you would use to describe me if you were talking about me behind my back? Mm -hmm. And then the third thing that you ask is, if you didn't know I was a blank, a UX designer, fill in the blank, if you didn't know I was that, what would you see me doing with my life? Just ask those three things. Yep. And if you don't want to do the 360 or the speed of trust or like any of these like personality assessments, whatever, then go ask those questions anonymously. Yep. And you, yeah, it's surprising. It's eye opening. Yep. Um, I, I had to, I kind of was told some things that I had to assess and be like, okay, that's what's being said. So yep. yeah, I, I totally agree. I think this is a huge topic. I think there's a lot more that could be said, a lot more that I want to personally pursue. Uh, we talked about, can we teach these things? Can we mm -hmm. help people become better at these things? And I think we can. Yeah. I think this is the maybe the start, at least for, for me to get into this space, mm -hmm. but we can. I think awareness is the very beginning. You know, there's a lot of assessments out there online available, and maybe it starts there, but uh, opening yourself up, uh, becoming aware of, of what's happening, and then taking kind of that... Uh, uh, I, I can't remember the word I'm looking for, but taking that internal assessment of yourself and uh, you start somewhere. Yeah. I think it's important. Yeah. Before we wrap up, I do want to give you, give you an opportunity to maybe plug some of these uh, Medium articles. How can they find you on Medium? So the easiest way is just medium.com forward slash Mike W. Curtis. Cool. And that'll take you to the publication that I've created that has all those. Cool. Anything else you want to plug? No, I just appreciate you having me on here, man. It's awesome. been great. Thanks for all you do for the community. Yeah, I have uh, I love this community just as much as you do. And it's a, it's a cool place to be in. We've got a lot of people willing to help and collaborate. And so, again, I'll probably plug this on your behalf. And I doubt you'll take it back. But if uh, if you got further questions from Mike, reach out, find a way to, to get a hold of him. And I know just by knowing Mike that he's happy to answer them. Thanks, Dylan. Okay, appreciate it. That's another episode of Design Today.